Two years ago, while walking around a flea market, I saw this swage block sitting in the grass. I noticed it was in two pieces, and the guy that I bought it from said, well, now it's like basically getting two for one money. As soon as I saw it, I knew I was going to try to fix it. It's been sitting in the dirt for a while, and it's definitely over 100 years old. A swage block is a blacksmithing tool that you use to drift holes and shape metal, and this one's definitely pretty valuable considering it's four inches thick and about 18 by 13 if it was one piece. My goal is going to be to try to weld it together using some nickel rod because this is cast iron and I won't be able to weld it using my normal MIG or TIG welding process. It's packed with dirt, so my first task is to try to get some of the dirt and crud out from inside it, which is actually more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I'm using a chisel and a rod and eventually I'm going to move up to a drill press to just sort of try to massage this dirt out of there before I go ahead and put it in some rust removing soak. To try to get some of this out of the actual holes, this old 3 8 drill bit actually did the trick and was able to move some of that dirt and crud out there. And I have no idea the last thing this thing, last time this thing was actually used and if it was just dropped or hit too hard or really what the story was. Either way, I think it's going to make a great piece once it's brought back into one piece and that'll be pretty easy once I get the rust off of it. In order to remove the rust, I'm going to use a rust removing soak and the first thing I have to do is find a vessel that will hold this and this garbage pail is going to work nicely for the large section and then a bucket for the other. I'm going to put four gallons of this WD-40 specialist rust removing soak in there and this is fresh product that just came right out of the jugs so it's going to be the most effective versus this stuff that's in the five gallon pail which I've used on a bunch of projects in the past. Now you can use this stuff over and over and I do use some water bottles to kind of add some displacement which is going to help kind of keep these covered and really show what areas get de-rusted and what don't. The stuff I had in the bucket didn't really remove the actual rust on the swage block as well as I wanted but the fresh stuff did a great job. You can see how quickly and how nicely it looks all cleaned up. This is only after about two days and it even takes some of the latent paint off of there. It gets all the rust out of the inside crevices, which is a great thing versus trying to get in there with a wire wheel. And I wound up putting the small section in that other bucket for a day and it did the job to remove the rust. I will be able to keep using this product again, but it's just not as quick and not as effective after it's been used a bunch of times. Now that I got most of the rust off, I can use the chisel to kind of get some of the crud and corrosion off of the edges and clean it up a little bit better before I bring it onto the bench to start preparing to weld it. In order to keep my table from getting messed up, I put this one inch thick piece of plate on there and then I can sort of figure out how I'm going to line this up to add some mechanical fasteners and keep this thing together prior to welding. Now you can see the way it fits like a puzzle on one end and there's a gap on the other and on the area where it actually is touching both pieces, I'm going to use some quarter 20 bolts to give some pins and actually help keep this thing together. Now this is cast iron like I mentioned and there's always kind of been the recommendation passed to me that you should add some mechanical fasteners if possible anytime you're trying to weld cast iron. Cast iron welds want to crack and any mechanical advantage you can give with some nuts and bolts can really be helpful. So I use a number 7 drill bit to drill straight through both pieces and then a tap to actually tap the holes inside the material for some quarter 20 bolts. Now you'll notice that I have three holes in there but I'm only going to use two, hard, two pieces of hardware and that's because I broke my tap in the middle one so we're not going to be able to use it. I'm using some flathead hardware here that'll sit below the surface and then I'll just plug weld over it once I get into the welding section. I countersunk these and put them together. I put some quarter 20 bolts in there and tightened it up and already this thing is starting to take shape. Now on the other side there's about a half an inch gap. I filled in some material and then I'm going to use a fared duo disc which is a grinding and cutoff wheel. I've done a video about these in the past and this is going to help me get into those kind of nooks and crannies on this crack and grind this out to make it flat so I can fit a nice brand new piece of half inch plate in there which is going to bridge the gap and allow me to weld straight through it. Now I grabbed this plate, I marked out what I needed and I'm going to be using some bolts on this side as well. Now in this case the distance is a little farther than what I have with flathead hardware so I'm going to have to use button head stuff but it's basically the same process. I use a clamp to keep the whole thing together and then I drill a hole straight through the cast iron then through the mild steel and into the other piece of cast and then I use a number seven drill as a locator to keep this whole thing in place while I drill the second hole. Now I don't have any flathead bolts that'll fit this so the button head screw I'm going to counter bore with this special drill bit that I'll show in a second but before I do that I just drill this out with the number seven and do my sort of drill and tap operation to make sure that I've got plenty of thread in there and I can get a nice good mechanical advantage with some bolts on this casting. 
This is the the drill bit I'm going to use to counter bore. It's just made by DeWalt. You can basically get a nice flat head. And you can see the way those bolt heads are recessed, and I went straight through that piece of mild steel. I marked everything out so I knew the orientation of it all, and then I brought it over to the downdraft table to grind some bevels before I start the welding process. I'm using a Ferret Victo grain disc here, which I've talked about a lot. It's a heavy stock removal disc, and it really makes quick work of this cast iron. And this downdraft table is not made for metal, but I have some metal filters in it. I get a lot of questions about it, and it's been really great. Now you'll see I put some fire brick down on my table, and then a piece of one inch plate, and then the swage block on top. That's to isolate the heat away from my fixture table. This is a nice precision ground table, so I don't want to add any additional heat to it if I can avoid it. And this is just going to help isolate the heat off the table. Now, there are going to be some flashes coming up when I start the welding, so just be warned. I put that clamp on there to keep any warping from happening, and then I start heating this whole thing up with a rosebud. I was very careful and slow to heat this up as best I could, and then I start welding with the nickel rod. I'm using my Lincoln Square Wave 200, which is normally used for TIG welding for me as my power source. And I'm using the Lincoln Electric TechRod 99 nickel alloy welding electrode. And that's made specifically for cast iron. Now you're gonna notice the way the stick electrode is kind of perfect for this application. And you'll also notice that I'm using a needle scaler in order to kind of peen over the welds right after I do the welding itself. Here's a big crack that I was able to weld with two passes on top. And if you're looking closely, you'll notice that I'm getting some pretty bad porosity and I'm not really sure what I'm doing wrong here. So if you have a lot of experience with nickel welding rod, please leave me a comment down below. I'm always kind of learning with these sorts of process and I really would appreciate some pointers as to get better results when I'm doing this kind of repair. After a while, I felt like I got the hang of it, but I still felt like I was melting the base metal away relatively quickly, but the peening, welding, and sort of reheating definitely was helping, and I didn't hear any major cracking, which is a big problem when you're welding cast iron. I think overall, it was a mix of my amperage and kind of my speed, along with the peening that kept this thing together without actually having any major cracks while I was welding it. Some of the areas got a lot of heat and some of them just got a quick weld, but I tried to keep the whole piece relatively evenly heated and I tried to let it cool as slowly as possible by doing a lot of this kind of pre and post heat in between welding. The rosebud helped me out, kept this thing at a nice temperature and you can see the way those long stick electrodes get inside this four inch casting and really allow me to get into places that I wouldn't have been able to hit with a MIG or TIG welder. There were a couple areas that needed a lot of weld and I would sort of add some on and then relayer it and try to build this up as best I could. The goal here is not to make this thing perfect, but the goal is to make it so that it doesn't break in half again. That's the area that had that big gap. And you can see the way I kind of built that up and checked the areas to make sure that I didn't miss anything before going back and adding a little bit more weld in any of the cracks inside the casting that I may have come across. In the end, with the piece getting hotter, it definitely was melting away faster, so I had to turn down my amperage a little bit. But again, any tips that anybody can offer, I'd be all ears to hear how I could do this better with that nickel Tech Rod 99 the next time. I let it cool overnight as slowly as I could, and then it was time to bring it outside and grind it. This thing's pretty heavy, and it definitely is a lot harder to move now that it's one solid piece but I was able to use my Victor grain disc to take down the majority of the welds on top and then this polyfan curve to get inside this sort of curved section on the side. Now swage blocks have a lot of different shapes on the tops, sides, and sort of all over them in order to manipulate metal. You can see there's some geometric shapes on the side, some kind of polygons, some flat sections. You've got a variety of different squares and circles and some sort of rectangles. And the idea here is that you can use all these different shapes to move metal in whatever way you need. So you want to try to preserve those as best you can. So you can see I'm trying to grind away this area where I had a lot of weld. In the end, I'm really just trying to make this presentable and as flat as I can because any marks that I leave on it will and can be transferred to whatever piece I'm hitting next. Now, once I did the majority of the grinding on the face, I went at this with a heavy cut tungsten carbide burr from Farad, and this is sort of a pointed burr and this is going to allow me to get into some of those hard to reach places on the four inch thick casting. What's nice about this was I was able to hit it from both sides, which was able to allow me to kind of get this thing ground down so that none of these shapes had any major protruding welds inside them. The whole point of having all these cool shapes is that you can use them throughout. So getting these shapes reground as best I could was definitely important. 
The pointed die did a lot for me, but eventually I switched over to this sort of just rounded rectangle one. And this is gonna allow me to kind of take down some of the heavier welds. I'm using this 12 volt Milwaukee die grinder. And you'll notice that I'm putting my wrenches in this little holder on the side. I actually make and sell these. And if you ever haven't used one of these die grinders, you'll know that misplacing these wrenches is very easy to do. So in order to avoid that, I keep the wrenches right on the tool and it allows me quickly to kind of swap them out. You can buy these on my website. I'll put a link down in the description. I continue to grind out as best and as much as I can. And you can see how nice the inside of that circle came out. And then I go ahead and dress the top. I switch from the polyfan curve to a flap disc, clean up the top as best I can, and then I'll go ahead and use a Rolock disc to kind of deburr the edges and eventually move over to a band file, which is just going to sort of help clean things up. Like I said, any marks or any kind of major defects on the face will be transferred to whatever workpiece you hit. So I might eventually go ahead and mill this flat over on the milling machine. For now, I'm looking for one piece out of two. So if I can just get this thing together, I'm happy. After the grinding, I move this thing back inside and then I can add some finish to it. Now it's much heavier and harder to move. You can see the scale once you see it on top of this 400 pound anvil. Like I said, this is about 18 by 13, four inches thick, and I'll use some boiled linseed oil to protect it and it'll keep it from rusting and sort of clean it up and make it look nice before I go ahead and eventually clean it up on the milling machine. Now, because having this thing be perfect would be great, but honestly, having it functional is awesome. This is a great piece for me to have in my shop. It's definitely pretty valuable. I think I paid about 150 bucks for it as two pieces, and I think it's probably worth close to a thousand now. I'm really happy with how it came out, and eventually I'll make a stand and mill it perfectly flat, but for now, at least it's one piece. Thanks for watching. Check me out right here on Instagram, and I hope to see you on the next video.